Hello everybody. So let's start our module on organic structure determination. So what do we mean by structure determination? Well, we actually mean how the atoms are connected. Okay. It's that simple. Uh, if we take a look many years ago, this was quite an endeavor. Here is quinine. Uh, quinine happens to be a treatment for malaria. It was discovered a long time ago, but it took over 50 years to determine its structure. Uh, the next big structural thing that I want to talk about is penicillin. If we take a look up here, we see three different structures that were proposed for penicillin. It took many years to come up with these proposals, and it, as it turns out, only one of them was right, uh, and this was determined by Dorothy Hodgkin uh, using X-ray crystallography. Now, there's lots of other methods for structure determination, and that's what this chapter is about. From the simplest structure determination, the first thing we need to know is what elements are in our molecule. For organic compounds, there's going to be carbon, there's going to be hydrogen, there may be oxygen, there may be halogens, there may be sulfur, phosphorus. There's different ways of determining this. The simplest way to determine the carbon and hydrogen, and often oxygen if that's all you have, is through a destructive elemental analysis where you simply oxidize your sample with a stream under high temperature with a stream of oxygen coming through. You can have something that will absorb the water, something else will absorb carbon dioxide, and that will tell you how much hydrogen you have, how much carbon you have. So you can imagine that if you had methane, It just gives you CO2 and H2O. Let's balance this. One, two, three, four, one. It's all balanced. So we could burn methane in oxygen, get our CO2 and H2O, and determine the amount of carbon and hydrogen in it. If there were oxygen in this molecule, there's not in this case, you would know by the difference uh, how much oxygen was there. So let's Take an, an example here. Combustion analysis of a 2.37 gram sample was performed and was found to contain 64.6% carbon, 10.8% hydrogen, and 24.6% oxygen. How do we determine its empirical formula? First thing we're gonna do is hit the easy button and we're gonna assume we have 100 grams of material. If we make that assumption, then it's easy because we can say that we have 64.6 grams of carbon. We have 10.8 grams of hydrogen and 24.6 grams of oxygen. The next thing we're going to do is just divide by the atomic mass of each of those elements and that will give us an empirical formula right away. It won't be a very convenient empirical formula. So let's take a look. If we divide 64.6 grams times by 12.01 grams per mole, which is the atomic mass of, of carbon, we get C 5.38 moles of carbon. Our hydrogen, we need to divide by 12.01, I'm sorry, that was silly, 1.08 grams per mole, our grams cancel out and that gives us 10.7 uh, moles of hydrogen and our oxygen So what we're going to do is divide each of these by the smallest coefficient, and that will give us uh, some idea. Might give us right away whole number coefficients. Turns out it doesn't. We get C3.49, H6.95, and O1. Now, 
these are close enough this is close enough to 7 that we can assume 7 this is close enough to 3.5 to give us C 3.5 H 7 O we're going to double that because we like to have whole number coefficients for our empirical formula and that gives us C 7 H 14 O2 for our empirical formula. Now that's our empirical formula. What we want to do any kind of structure determination or to know what our molecule is, is a molecular formula. We can do that simply by figuring out uh, the molar mass of our compound. We have different ways of doing that experiment. You'll remember from first year. Again, this is stuff you should know. You could use freezing point depression, boiling point elevation, osmotic pressure, all of these would give you a molar mass. So once you have the empirical formula and the molar mass, you can use that to determine the molecular formula. Uh, so it's quite easy once you have the molecular formula. Let's consider now we have a molecular formula, CH2F2. Let's go ahead and draw the Lewis structure. So we have oops. Here's one structure we could draw. Oh, I could also draw this structure. And I can draw this structure. All of these are valid Lewis structures. How do we know what our compound is? Well, we don't. We have to do further experiments. All of these are different compounds. They're going to have different chemistries, different properties. They may be similar, but they're still not the same molecules. They're going to be slightly different. Uh, so how do we do that? How do we know what kind of bonds are present? Well, notice I knew there was a double bond in that structure. I knew that simply by the molecular formula. We'll talk about that in just a second. So I knew there was a double bond. The molecular formula actually tells us something about whether or not we have rings or single and double bonds, at least the possibility. Um, what other functional groups are present? What if we had a drawn, here's one, here's a molecule that has a carbonyl group. This is simply acetone, but it has this functionality, the carbonyl group in it. We can have other functionalities. We can have double bonds. We can have amines. We can have aromatic rings. We can have imines. So there's lots of possibilities. What about the connectivity? So uh, these here's another molecule. That has a carbonyl group. And it, these two have the same molecular formula, but they're different molecules. This is an aldehyde, and this is a ketone. Quite a bit different. We're going to learn a lot about their chemistry later on in the course, by the way, about the chemistry of those two types of functional groups. The carbonyl group, which can be further divided into ketones, aldehydes, esters, carboxylic acids. So. One of the first things we look for is the degree of unsaturation, and we can get that degree of unsaturation simply from the molecular formula. We'll see in just a second. But what do I mean by the degree of saturation? Well, the only difference between these two, this is C2H6. And this is C2H4. We've lost two hydrogens. We've lost H2. And we went from a ethane, which has nothing but single bonds, 
to ethene, which has a double bond. We say that it's unsaturated. This has an unsaturation number of 1. The molecular formula for any straight chain or any alkane which has no rings and alkanes have no double bonds is CxH2x plus 2. As soon as we have one double bond, an alkene will be CxH2x. We lose the element of hydrogen. H2, we lose the mole a molecule of hydrogen. We talk about it as being unsaturated. If it were saturated, all of the carbons will have as many hydrogens around them as possible. Now, rings will also give us an unsaturation of number of one because we have to remove two hydrogen atoms in order to make a carbon-carbon double bond. So notice this molecule, which has a ring as well as three double bonds has an unsaturation number of four. So that tells us a lot already, that unsaturation number. We can determine that unsaturation number simply from the molecular formula. <coughs> now it's easy if we just have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen uh, because oxygen doesn't appear in the number for, for determining the unsaturation number divalent atoms do not. Uh, so C7H6, if we have seven car carbons, a saturated molecule would have 16 hydrogens and the oxygens won't make a difference. So this 16 minus six is 10 divided by two equals five. Here has an unsaturation number of five. C8H10, easy enough. If all of the carbons had nothing but hydrogens on them and no rings, so we only had carbon-carbon and carbon-hydrogen bonds, we would have uh, 18 hydrogens, sorry. And that gives us an unsaturation number then of 18 minus 10 equals... 8 divided by 2 equals 4. Saturation number of 4. Here we go. This one's a little bit harder. This is where we might use this formula. So our unsaturation number here is equal to the number of tetravalent atoms times 2 plus 2 plus the number of trivalent atoms times 1 and the number of of halogens. Now, what other tetravalent atoms might there be if it's an organic compound? There might be some silicon. For trivalent, you might have phosphorus. You might have something else. Uh, so let's take a look then at what the unsaturation number is. We have 2 times 10 carbons plus two from here, plus we have two nitrogens, so that's plus two, minus, X is our number of monovalent atoms, hydrogen or halogens, and we have 14, all of this divided by two, so we have 20, two, four, minus 14 is 10 divided by 2 and saturation number 5. What might this be? Well, it could be lots of things. But whenever I see a large unsaturation number, one of the things I think about, and if I have enough atoms, phenyl rings account for an unsaturation of 4. Now we have... We have... 10, so here's 10. I'm going to draw this. We have 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 carbons. We have 5. We have 5, 6, 7, 8, 
9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 hydrogens and two nitrogens. So this fits, but I could connect this in different ways. So there's still lots of things to determine. Uh, even after I've uh, determined the molecular formula, the unsaturation number, I can draw a lot of possibilities. And then you can imagine if we have large molecules, those possibilities get more and more. So here's some interesting molecules from nature. Look at all of these molecules. How do we determine these structures? Well, what we typically do is we take our structure and we figure out what fragments are there. And then it's like a jigsaw puzzle. So we use different methods to determine the fragments, uh, usually instrumental, uh, IR spectroscopy, a few more we're going to learn. But for example, in this particular molecule, we have a CH3 fragment. Notice that the CH3 fragment is a terminal fragment because it can only be bonded to one other thing. The same as this phenyl group. If we determine that as a fragment, it's also a terminal fragment. So we have uh, CH3s are fragments. Uh, so it turns out maybe we have two of these fragments. Uh, notice, oh yeah, we do. Here's one and here's one. We have a carbonyl fragment, a CH2 fragment. They're divalent. They can go in the middle. Nitrogen has three bonds. It can be a branching fragment. So this particular molecule fits with this. We've determined all our fragments. We put them together. We could put them together this way, but there's other ways we can put it together as well. So even after we find the fragments, we're going to find that we need to be cagey and look at our uh, data to figure out how the fragments connect together. So in a jigsaw puzzle, you have color to help you out there. In uh, structure determination, what you're going to find out is that with NMR, that gives us the color so that we can put our fragments together in the correct order. So NMR, by the way, is nuclear magnetic resonance. So we typically use instrumental methods for structure determination. We're not going to talk a lot about uh, ultraviolet spectroscopy, but we are going to talk about uh, mass spectrometry and nuclear magnetic resonance. You guys have already been exposed to IR spectroscopy, and IR spectroscopy gives you information about what functional groups are present. We're going to find out that mass spectrometry helps us find out our molecular formula, but it gives us some information about connectivity because it tells us where we have strong and weak bonds and what our molecule fragments into. So we get some fragmentation information. Which can help us. Nuclear magnetic resonance is the one that's really powerful uh, because it gives us extensive information about molecular structure and atom connectivity. This is the powerful one. This is the one we go to most often to make that final determination. But even it may be difficult with some of this other without some of this other information. So you guys recall uh, IR spectroscopy from last semester and uh, it gives you information about functional groups. So here we see an IR spectrum of a simple alkane and the only thing that we know is that there doesn't appear to be much here other than carbon-carbon and carbon-hydrogen bonds. Uh, but it does give us some information. For example, it tells us that there's nothing over here which we would expect if we had any Carbon hydrogen bonds where the carbons were sp2 or sp hybridized. We also have nothing in here, which is where we would see the other functionalities like triple bonds. Remember, um, they'll give us a stretch if they're unsymmetrical somewhere around here. And carbonyl groups, which will give us information in here. Okay, so, so we're going to mention IR spectroscopy as we go through this and the rest of the course, in fact. When we take a look at other functional groups and their chemistry, we'll mention uh, where those functional groups appear in the IR spectrum. Again, notice that 
These three different types of carbon-hydrogen bonds have three different absorptions in the IR. And it's very easily seen. So here's an alkane. We typically, the nice thing is there's this demarcation right at 3,000 wave numbers. Anything on this side is going to be sp3 hybridized carbon bonded to hydrogen. And anything on this side, the first one is uh, sp2 hybridized carbon bonded to hydrogen. Gives us a stretch at about 3,100. And sp hybridized carbon hydrogen bonds give us a stretch out at about 3,300. So it's formative. There's lots of different functional groups, and we can break our NMR spectrum into what we call the fingerprint region. This we look at once we have a pretty good idea, we'll get a, a real sample and take a look at the fingerprint region and tell us, see what it is there. This gives us information about carbon hydrogen bonds. Here we get some oxygen or uh, oxygen hydrogen and nitrogen hydrogen bonding. And in here we get our triple bond region, and here is our information about our carbon hetero double bonds, either carbon oxygen, carbonyls, or carbon nitrogen imines. So that's it for this module. I'll put the next module up shortly. Thank you.